Well, hi, everybody. It's Philip Shields, and there's something in most of us that make us really curious about what's coming ahead. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today, prophets and prophesying. Understand that prophesying can also include someone speaking under divine inspiration. It doesn't have to be foretelling. So we check weather forecasts. We want to know if a hurricane's on the way. We like knowing what's coming down the road. So many, therefore, love prophecy sermons. <clears throat> Some others think it's all bogus, don't want to spend any time on prophecy. But most of us are curious. We're actually told that a third of the Bible is prophecy. And Revelation 1-3 blesses those who read and study the book of Revelation, which is all prophecy. So the best would be to realize the importance of prophecy and how to recognize true prophet from false ones. False prophets, the Bible tells us, are very dangerous. God is not wanting his children uh, spending time with false prophets. He doesn't. And I'll show you those. In the past, we had famous soothsayers. I don't think I can call them prophets. Like Nostradamus, who wrote a book in 1555. Like Jean Dixon, a psychic who died in 1997. Um, and if you look up the word psychics, there are just hundreds and hundreds of them. And the Bible forbids us, by the way, going to palm readers, crystal ball gazers, uh, mediums who talk to the dead for us. Don't go there. God prohibits it. Don't disobey God. Now, let me ask you, if you had a choice to go to a service on a Wednesday night coming up, and one place says that they're going to be revealing without any doubt who the beast and the false prophet are of Revelation 13. Come and learn, the sign says. And across the street to another building or group, church, and their title is How to Grow More in Having and Exhibiting God's Love. Who do you think will draw more crowds? And yet, the other one's very important topic. So that's what we're talking about today. True prophets, false prophets, how to tell them apart. Part one is going to be all about prophets, what God says about them. Part two will be what God says about his prophets in the church and how to recognize false prophets. And there's so many scriptures about prophets, true and false, all through the Old and New Testament. We're literally, if we wanted to, can be bombarded with nonstop teachers, preachers, prophets talking to us about how God spoke to them and what God says he wants them to share with everybody. Some of them may be true prophets. A lot of them are not. Today I will address these points. Understand there's going to be, and there probably are already, lots of true prophets in God's church today and in the years to come. Realize that. Believe that. Many of us were raised to be very suspicious of any so-called prophets. And we always even kidded that we were a non-profit organization. And yes, besides the true prophets, there are going to be many, many, even more so, many false prophets. Remember when Elijah was a true prophet, there were like 400 priests, priests of Baal. And these false prophets can even do signs and miracles and even preach in Jesus' name, do wonders in his name. That can be very enticing and very convincing that by the signs and wonders that they do, that they are God's prophets. So how do we recognize false prophets from true ones? What does God say are the signs You've got a false prophet you're talking to, or a true prophet. Can true prophets include women as well as men? And yes, yeah, absolutely. Do you realize that to prophesy, again, includes inspired, uh, inspired words from God, not necessarily foretelling? Although I think most of us, when we think of the word prophecy and prophesying, think in terms of foretelling inspired by God. So welcome everyone again to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields, host and founder. 
And here we try to focus on forming a really close, solid bond with God our Father and Jesus Christ, the Shua, the Messiah, as our Savior and King. And we try to make that our focus more and more relationship. In other words, it's a, it's a website. This website is geared to relationship mostly. Sometimes, like today, we're talking about other things like prophets. And uh, we also want to draw you to that intimate contact, though, with God. And also hope that you will help us, if you're able to, uh, with our work that we're doing in East Africa right now, especially in Kenya and Tanzania and Malawi, Uganda. And uh, we have literally scores, scores of foster children who are needing help and widows and so forth. These, those people over there are so poor. I really recommend you watch my sermon called The Least of These My Brethren. I think it will surprise you as well, but you'll learn in that one. And the least of the brethren are not the people of Kenya. It's someone else. So find out. I think you'll be really surprised. I'm also noticing YouTube has loads of self-proclaimed prophets. They each claim to have a word from God. They had a dream. I've had a dream. I've had a vision. They claim that God himself or Jesus himself spoke words to them that they are to convey to everybody else. So let's talk about that. In Joel 2, quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost, People were speaking as the Holy Spirit filled them. It says, all of them spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance in Acts 2 verse 4. All of them. All of them was not just the 12 apostles. In the verses before Acts 2, there were no chapter breaks in the original Bible. You find that there were 120 who were gathered. 120 that were gathered, including women who are listed by name. I suspect very much that all of these 120 were there for Pentecost. All 120 spoke. I don't think they were preaching because women are not allowed to be preaching. They're not allowed to be pastors. Women can speak, though, and there's a fine line between preaching and speaking, I guess. Anna, in the temple, for example, was a prophetess, we read in Luke 2, who was proclaiming the Messiah. She was 84 years old. She was speaking, and she was proclaiming the Messiah. And Philip the Evangelist had four daughters who were prophetesses. We'll read more about that later in this two-part sermon. But now let's read what Peter was quoting from Joel 2, Verses 28 to 31, again, I'm talking about this because I wonder how many prophets you can identify for me in your church, in your congregation that you attend, or even in the greater church, uh, the various other congregations that form up your, uh, your, your, uh, your overall church. In Joel 2, verses 28 to 31, shall come to pass afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And Peter was quoting this. I'll pour out my spirit. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my manservants and maidservants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. By saying that, he's making the point, you know what? Prophesying is not just for leaders of the church, not just for apostles and pastors, even servants. Maybe a woman who works at a motel cleaning rooms or is a servant in someone's home. Even they will be prophets. And then he goes on to talk about the signs in the heavens in verse 30 and 31 before the coming and awesome day of the Lord, of Jehovah. Verse 29 makes it very clear that they weren't just men and women, but even servants. Not just leaders, but servants can be prophets. 
Again, Joel 2 is not about false prophets, but God's people. We should be finding prophets in our own churches soon, I hope. I don't claim to be a prophet foretelling. I may be a prophet in the understanding of inspired speaking from time to time from God. I hope so. But not foretelling so far. I hope you see the difference. But speaking from inspiration can also be a can also be prophesying. You don't need to be preaching to do that, like Anna wasn't preaching. She was just talking to people who came to the temple complex and says, I want you to know I have a word from God that the Messiah has been born. We're going to see him so soon. The Redeemer of Israel. So Paul in Ephesians 4.11 makes it very clear that God was choosing for the work of ministry. He was calling some to be prophets. First he says apostles, Ephesians 4.11. Some to be apostles and some prophets, some pastors and some teachers and so on, some evangelists. He names different ones, but prophets. We should be finding prophets in the church. So please, we might have to unlearn this thing that there are no prophets in the church. There are going to be if there aren't now. But don't be overly suspicious of somebody whom others are revealing to you as a prophetess or prophet. Okay, now, and believe that God does still speak to people. He wants to speak to you. I have three sermons on hearing God's voice. If God could speak through a donkey, Balaam's jackass, he certainly can speak through you, whether you're a man or woman. Expect him to answer you in his word or by someone talking to you, saying something that you realize is a word from God, or that you have as a strong, strong thought that you know you didn't originate, and other ways that God speaks to us, and respond to those. If you get a very strong, strong thought as simple as get off the freeway right now, I've had probably nine or ten of those, and in every case I can find a, a reason for it later on. I'd pull off for a few minutes, and then get back on. Sure enough, there were there were ambulances coming and fire trucks. A great big accident. Over and over this has happened. And it was just like a strong thought. I didn't hear any words. No one, my wife didn't hear any words beside me. But as simple as get off the freeway. Now, if I disregarded that, I may have missed the accident. I may not have. But the more we respond to when God does talk to us, I believe the more we will actually get more of him talking to us. Later on, you'll have uh, more profound insights into maybe understanding parts of God's word better, specific verses. You may have uh, God, God speaking to you to call somebody. I've had that happen many times. Um, I was having breakfast with my wife and cereal. And I was still a young man in my 20s. And I stopped halfway up to my mouth, and I just said, I've got to call Jim. She said, why? I said, I don't know. I just had this really strong order in my head saying, call Jim now. I called Jim, and it was a, an emergency he was having. And uh, I don't want to get into all that now, but I'm just saying he had been praying that I would call him. And he was crying on the phone and said, I don't think God hears me anymore. I said, are you kidding? I just got the word to call you just now, and you said you were just praying about it. Of course God still hears you, even with the horrible thing you did do. You repented. God hears you. I want you to know he loves you and hears you. I'm supposed to tell you that. So you'll have more of those the more that you will respond to the times God does call you. Maybe God will call you to be a prophet. Don't poo-poo that idea. So let's learn all about this, not just about false prophets, but about, but about God's true prophets, how to recognize who's who. In Amos 3.5, we have very comforting words from God. Surely Jehovah God does nothing. Amos 3.5. The Lord God, Jehovah God, does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. That's not just for the good old days. 
but for us today as well and in the years to come. And the prophets are not necessarily, as I was more or less taught growing up, the leaders of the church. No, it can be like I just read to you, even maid servants and, and, and men servants and men and women. Now let's turn to Second Peter 1. Remember that if you print out the notes or have them on your laptop as you listen to it, and just scroll down as I speak, you'll see the scriptures on there. The, the notes are not an exact transcript by any means of what I, what I say. I say a lot more in the voice than I can transcribe. But they'll help you have the scriptures in front of you. Okay, now, a true prophet can never make something up about prophecy. Cannot. It's not from God if he makes it up himself. Second Peter 1, verses 19 to 21, I'm reading from the Legacy Bible Translation. We have as more sure the prophetic word, now this is about foretelling in this case, to which you do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation. You can't just make, a, make up a prophecy, or you can't just decide this is what it means on your own. No prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation. Verse 21, for no prophecy was ever made by the will of men, but men being moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So a true prophecy is God speaking. You, it's you repeating what God spoke to you. Now, there's scripture after scripture that reminds us and warns us against false prophets. Remember, fallen angels can also give them some ideas of things that are coming up. So they can get pretty close on predicting things. But let's, let's read what God says about them. I'd like to ask you to read the last half of Jeremiah 23, where God warns against those claiming that they were uh, repeating what God had spoken to them. And God said, no, I never spoke to them. So read that on your own for time's sake. But not even, you know, we're being bombarded today by false prophets. If you go to YouTube or anything like that, you'll just see lots and lots of sermons and preachings and prophecies. Especially if you put down prophecies or something, I'm sure you'll get a lot. I'm not recommending you do that. But even the apostles didn't face what we face today, the, the volume, the constant uh, bombardment of these on YouTube, on Facebook, on internet, TV. Uh, but we also have so much of God's word, much, much more than even they had. Understand that Peter and Paul did not have the book of Revelation, for example. And realize this, the apostles probably didn't even own their own Bible. We think of a Bible as one book with 66 sub-books in it, epistles and other books in it. Uh, in Paul's day and Peter's day, these were scrolls. It was very expensive to, to have your own scroll. It had to be written out letter by letter and checked and double-checked for make sure no errors. How would they have carried around 66 scrolls? How would they have been able to afford them? Today we have countless Bibles on our smartphones and laptops. You, I hope you all, if you have a, a laptop, get Bible Hub and get Bible Gateway on your smartphone. On Bible Gateway, I like to go to that, open it up, and then on the top left corner you'll see three or four lines, and you click on that, and then you'll see where you can get to select a or there might be an ad that pops up, but 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 you, you, 
you get to see where you can select the part of scripture you want to listen to and which translation. And that's an audio. You can listen to it. So when I'm doing something that doesn't require a lot of mental power, I'll often play the Bible in the background. And then I'll play the same chapter often two or three times. Or if it's a short epistle of two or three chapters, or four chapters, I might just play the whole thing straight through the first time, and then play it again, and then play it again. So until I know that I know that epistle of Paul, or whatever. Bible Hub also is really good. In Bible Hub, you get the you can have access to all the many many and, and Bible Gateway, to many many other translations, to concordances, commentaries, the Greek and the Hebrew. We have so much that we have. To whom much is given, much will be required. Jesus said. Please keep that in mind. The apostles themselves never had a smartphone, with all sixty six books of the Bible and 30 translations in the palm of their hand. They would say, you guys are so spoiled. <laughs> okay, so why is this topic so important? Because I, I, I'm trying to, by the way, what I just said about the Bible, one of the key things to understanding and working with true and false prophets is to know your Bible. That was a point I was leading to. Know your Bible, read it, listen to it, hear it. Again and again, and again and again. Especially books and chapters you haven't read for a long time, maybe. Why is this topic so important? Because Yeshua says, Jesus says, we can be led astray and deceived. End up wasting time with false prophets. Yeshua says that in the very last days there will be a great false prophet who will be so convincing that he almost deceives even the very elect, the children of God. So don't you be the one who gets deceived. You'll be doing great signs and wonders in behalf of the great beast power and pointing people to worship the great beast power, the political, economic, military power who is coming to rule the earth as much as he can, one world order. So you and I need to be far more careful about listening to false prophets and teachers than we probably have been. Please, please be aware of that. Of that. Now, warnings about false prophets. Matthew 24, 24 and 25. False messiahs, false Christ. Christ, messiah, it all means anointed one. So Yeshua means savior. So you say Jesus Christ, we're saying savior, the anointed one. Okay, Yeshua, the messiah. Okay, but he said false anointed ones, false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even you, even the elect, meaning the believers, the true believers. See, I've told you this beforehand, he said. They'll be so convincing with great signs and wonders and miracles that you'll say, boy, I mean, they're doing it in Jesus' name. This is a true child of God. i got to listen to him. Jesus is saying, well, look out. Know what you're doing, because you can be ending up getting deceived. So be very careful who you listen to. Be very careful which prophets you're so enthralled with. It might be a false prophet. And again, I don't think any false prophet has ever gotten up that I'm aware of and said, I want you all to know right off the bat, I'm a false prophet. I don't think you'll ever hear that. I think they all think they're true prophets. Matt, that's important to understand that. Matthew seven twenty one to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven 
You're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven simply by claiming that you believe in Jesus. Saying, Lord, Lord. Yeah, you have to believe in Jesus. Yes, there's no other name under heaven given by which we must be saved. I know that. But when you really believe, you really obey and you really follow him. It says in 1 John 2 that those who claim to know him must walk as he walked. Must keep his commandments or else you don't know him. 1 John 2 verses 3 to 6. Came okay, back to Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Many will say to me, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? In your name. And done many wonders in your name. Are you getting the point? False prophets are doing this in Jesus' name. Oh, it's easy to call someone a false prophet if we know it's a witch or a, a shaman or whatever all these people are, you know, voodoo and all that. that. That's easy. But when someone is doing mighty works and miracles in Jesus' name and you witness those, you can be deceived. And then I will declare to them, verse 23, I never knew you. What a terrifying thing to ever have to hear from Jesus Christ. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. No law. Workers of iniquity. Iniquity is lawlessness. Don't base your conclusion on whether someone's a true prophet or not on their miracles, on their healings, on their charisma. Remember, there's no record. John the Baptist, a great prophet who prophesied about the coming Messiah. There's not a single record of him doing a single miracle. Not at all. I hope you're following what I'm saying. So it doesn't matter how nice they might sound around you or might be. Yeshua says, look at their fruit. Know them by their fruit. Look what he says here in Matthew 7, just a few verses before that, in verse 15. Matthew 7, verse 15, now to 20. He says, beware of false prophets. Beware of them. Watch out for them. That's part of this message. We're not being bewaring enough. We're not watching out enough. Beware of false prophets. Don't just start listening to someone because he claims to have a word from God. Check them out. Test them, as I'm going to show you in part two. Beware of false prophets who come to you not in shepherd's clothing. Have you noticed this? They're part of your church sometimes. Even false prophets can be part of your church. They come to you in sheep's clothing. In other words, they come to you looking like a part of the flock. They don't come to you in shepherd's clothing. Well, they could, I suppose. But they come in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? No. Good tree bears good fruit. If you see in their life just a bunch of bad fruit, I don't mean what weak times they may have had 20, 30 years ago, but I'm talking about the last, the last few years of their life. Is there good fruit? And I don't mean they have to be perfect. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Paul even said he still sinned. Paul even said he still did the things he didn't want to do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me from this? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. That's the end of Romans 7. Beginning of Romans 8 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We have to walk in the Spirit. So when I say 
look at their fruit. I don't mean that they have to be perfect because none of us is perfect as far as our day-to-day -day actions. We still do things we don't want to do because there's this constant battle between the old nature and the new nature that we have. But verse 20, therefore by their fruits you'll know them. But look at the man's overall life or the woman's overall life. It's the prophetess. And I hope you understand, there will be prophetesses. Men and women shall prophesy, Joel too, right? And they can appear, these false prophets, as angels of light. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15 says that, just as Satan appears as an angel of light, but he wasn't, even though the translators gave him the name from the Latin word, Lucifer, meaning light bringer, in Isaiah 14, I think that is, um, the Hebrew word there, his name was Halel, that angel who rebelled, who became Hasatan, the, the, the adversary. The angel who rebelled. Halel was his name, H-E-Y-L-E-L, -E which has to do with light as well, but the light bringer is not him. The light bringer is Jesus Christ, is Yeshua. Okay? And I'm going to show you more of that maybe later in some other sermons. But there's also coming an end time prophet prophesying at the same time as God's two witnesses. The military beast power supported by the false prophet will eventually battle against them, war against them, it says in Revelation 11, and eventually kill the two witnesses. These are two prophets, two true good prophets of God who will be prophesying in Jerusalem, but they won't be popular. Why do I say that? Because they will have all power to pronounce plagues on all the earth, not just around Jerusalem. That there be no rain in the days of their prophecies, which last for three and a half years. They can turn water into blood. And they can, okay, we'll read that in a minute. But when Christ returns, okay, first of all, the two witnesses will lie dead for three and a half days in Jerusalem until they're resurrected just before the seventh trump, just before the real first resurrection. These two are kind of given an exception. Uh, the very first ones to be resurrected probably will be these two witnesses. The last shall be first, right? And then when Christ returns... You can read about them dying and being resurrected and meeting Christ in the air and then the seventh trump in Revelation 11, verses 7 to 15. Then when Christ returns, he captures the false prophet and the beast that he was supporting, the beast leader, throws him into the lake of fire. Revelation 19, verse 20. Then the beast, this is that military leader, Economic military leader. He's probably in, somewhere out there already. We don't know who he is yet. Probably not some great leader yet. He's going to be. The beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence in which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. The two of them were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, which is like sulfur. Really hot stuff. Don't want to get that on you. <laughs> It'll burn you. Second Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you by any means. That day, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the falling away comes first. There are other translations for this word falling away as well. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I believe there will be a third temple. There have been two temples in Jerusalem so far. I believe there will be a third one, 
and it's talking about that temple. It will be called the temple of God, just like Herod's temple was also called the temple of God, even though the leaders and the Pharisees and the priests were all, a lot of them were very wicked. Yeshua himself said, why do you make my father's house a den of thieves? He called that temple my father's house. I'm saying this because some people say, no, we can't possibly call that a temple of God if the false beast power is calling himself God in it. Well, that's what it says. Second Thessalonians 2, continuing in verse 9 and 10, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So he and the false prophet, it seems like they're both given power to do these incredible miracles and signs and wonders. The false prophet is doing this to point people to this beast power. As you'll see in Revelation 13 in a minute. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they didn't receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. I hope you all will keep alive a love for the truth. You must keep that alive or else you can be deceived. I just read it. Revelation 13 verses 11 to 18. Revelation 13 verses 11 to 18. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. Boy, don't be involved in anything to do with dragons. I'm really disappointed that Elon Musk is calling his spaceships things to do with dragon. It's too bad. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. The first beast is the political, economic, military power causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, the economic military leader, whose deadly wound was healed. Apparently something very, like an assassination attempt or something like that is going to happen. And it looks like he's going to die and then he's healed from it. And he performs, this false prophet, performs great signs. Now, in Second Thessalonians, it said that the one who sits in the temple of God also does great signs. But this false prophet does great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Remember, Jesus said that there's coming a false prophet and other false prophets that are so deceptive that even the elect come really close to being deceived, if possible. And we're going to say, wow, they're doing all these wonderful signs and miracles and healing the sick and, and uh, you know, maybe even in Jesus' name. I don't know, but, but maybe not. But, but I'm just saying, make fire come down from heaven. We're going to be thinking, boy, that's just like Elijah. And Malachi, at the end of Malachi, talks about how he'll send the Elijah, the prophet, in the last days. So maybe this is that Elijah. We can be deceived if we don't know the Bible really well. Verse 14, Revelation 13, 14, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast or to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image, to the image of the beast. If that's to be taken literally, that's going to be an awesome thing to see. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. We're going to have a repeat of Nebuchadnezzar having the great image that he put up. and Everyone had to bow down at, at it when the music began. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not. Daniel must have been out of town or something. In their case, God spared them. But he says those who won't bow down will be killed. 
if you want to live in Bible times, remember you are. You are living in Bible times. We're going to replay Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you will be the ones doing it. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand. A mark on their right hand. I just lost my place in my notes here. Hang on. Okay, verse 16. Small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads and that no one, remember we're sealed on our forehead as well. Certainly the 144,000 are in Revelation 7. That no one may buy or sell except one has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. The number is a number of men, 666. You won't be able to buy food, buy gasoline, petrol, whatever. You won't be able to buy a car. You won't be able to sell anything. You won't be able to pay your mortgage, pay your rent. You won't be able to have a job or get a job. It's going to be very tempting unless you really know God in faith. To go ahead and get the mark of the beast, whatever that all will pan out to be, we'll see. We'll see. There are some who are already proclaiming they know what the 666 is and all that. Well, I hope they're right. Otherwise, they're a false prophet. Are you seeing why it's so important to be on guard against false prophets? To know how to recognize them. Your life your life itself could be in danger. And if we're really, really close to God, I still believe there will be some of God's people, hopefully many of God's people, who will be taken to a place of safety. But not all will be. When you read the end of Revelation 12, and then Satan goes after the remnant of the woman who keep the commandments of God, who did not go into the wilderness, into her place. But anyway, don't be so quick to be giving so much time to self-proclaimed prophets who may not be God's prophets at all. Revelation 12 describes the great battle between these, Revelation 11, I mean, between these two final true prophets, the two witnesses, and the great false prophet and the beast power calling down fire from heaven Revelation 11, verse 3 to 6, I'll give power to my two witnesses. These are true prophets. They will prophesy 1,260 days, that's three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, the two lampstands, standing before the God of the earth. I think that's in Zechariah 4 that's quoting there. If anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies, and if anyone wants to harm them, they must be killed in this manner. They have power to shut heaven, so no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. They have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to strike the earth, the whole earth, with all plagues, as often as they desire. So they will not be very popular. So the big showdown is coming before long. And whoever those two witnesses are, whoever the great false prophet is, whoever the beast power is, I, for one, do not assume the false prophet has to be a pope. Maybe so, maybe not. He will be able to deceive and bring under his control the whole world. And who and where will this great beast power be centered? Many have traditionally believed Europe, more and more are starting to believe like an Islamic connection. I lean against the Islamic connection. I know many or some really believe it. Just keep your eyes open. Be willing to pivot. Be willing to ride loose in the saddle. 
So wake up, be on your guard, don't listen to false prophets that you can watch, for example, on Sid Roth's Supernatural TV broadcast. Prophet after prophet, so-called prophet, said God spoke to them in dreams or in words. And we'll pick up on that in part two. And I'll tell you what happened on Sid Roth. And I'll tell you who all is going on there. And I'll tell you what the Bible says, how we can define who the true prophets are and who the false prophets are. We have to have our guard up. Jesus said, don't take it la-di-da. He said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, who speak that they're doing all these things in Jesus' name, in Yeshua's mighty name. In your name did we not cast out demons, they said. So we'll pick up in part two. I don't want to take this any longer. So God bless you all. And let's just ask a quick dismissal and we'll prepare for part two. Father in heaven, we thank you so much. that You're a God of great love. And we love you so much. Help us love you ever more. Please help us learn what it means to beware of false prophets. Please help us stop wasting time on these dens that invite false prophets who claim that you spoke to them when you did not. Help us learn from that. Help us obey you. And help us distance ourselves from those. And yet let us also begin to realize that you will have prophets and prophetesses in the church, in your church, in your body of believers. Help us be willing to accept that, because that's what you say. So, Father in heaven, we ask your dismissal now, and we thank you so much. Yeshua, our heavenly Savior, we thank you. We pray that you will be our life more and more, that we may die, that you may live in us, that we die to the self resurrected in you, Christ. Thank you so much now, and we turn this all over to you, and we ask for your protection and your guidance in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen.